So here we are on the Sunday evening again, uh, continuing in our time of worship, the best we can do in the present circumstances. We still believe we're in the presence of God and we come to worship him in spirit and in truth. So we bow our heads and let's pray together. Father, we come to you and we thank you that we can come into your presence this evening. We believe that you're a God who is ever present. You're in every situation. You know all there is to know about everything. And we come to a God who is all powerful and a God who is merciful and gracious. And so we would ask you this evening that you will be with us and help us as we consider your word together. And also as we come to worship you, we pray you'd accept our thanks for all that you've done for us and all you continue to do for us. Thank you for your mercy made known in your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all in his name. We come thinking again of the day in which we live, praying for many churches, struggling to be able to communicate to their, to their uh, members, pray that you would be with them and help them in all they seek to do. And for those perhaps who listen in who are not normally listening to sermons and services, that you would perhaps challenge them and cause them to want to seek after you in these days. We pray for our land and we pray for our government. We ask that you give them much wisdom in guiding us in the ways in which we should go. And we pray that everything that is said and done in this time together now will be for your praise and your glory. We ask this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so we're in Matthew's chapter, Matthew's Gospel in chapter 23. This evening coming to the end of the chapter. Matthew ch chapter 23 and verse uh, 34 to the end. Jesus says these words. He says, therefore, therefore, Indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. But on you may come the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Sure, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I would have gathered you, your, your children together, as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. So that's the section that we're looking at this evening together. Matthew 23, 34 through to 39. We'll think about three things this evening. We'll think about the result of rejection. And then we will think about how Jesus reveals his heart. And also we'll think about the fact that Jesus says he will return. Now, the Jews had longed for the Messiah to arrive. It was part of their history. They'd longed and hoped that the Messiah would come. When a child was born, if he was a male, they hoped that he possibly would be the Messiah. They hoped that the Messiah would come and set up an earthly kingdom and bring them back to their former glory days. Yet when God sent his son and our saviour, instead of welcoming him, the religious leaders hated him. They despised him and they rejected him. And eventually, they had him executed. So here we have recorded the Lord's final message to them, having given many opportunities for them to repent, many, many opportunities for them to accept him. But the leaders generally, the religious leaders generally rejected him. In the end, they managed to turn the people against him and they managed to have him crucified. Now he'd spoken often of the, the welcome for all to come into his kingdom. But here he's speaking about the result of rejection. In verses 1 to 12, we saw that he had warned the people not to listen to the false teachers of the day. Verses 13 to 23, we saw last time the, the, the stern condemnation that Jesus brought upon those religious leaders, those hypocrites of the day. He, he calls out seven woes. He condemns this people for their, for their leadings and how they directed the people. He spoke about how they'd led people away from heaven and into hell. And so he wants to condemn them and he wants to show their, their hypocrisy. In verse 32, God's patience 
seems to have reached its limit with these people. We go back to Genesis in the beginning of the Bible and, and chapter chapter 6. It reminds us there that rejection results in judgment. God actually said, didn't he, in the days of Noah, my spirit will not always strive with man. So rejected, um, rejection resulted in a worldwide flood and only eight souls were saved in that flood. Verses 30 to 31, he says, you followed in the ways of your fathers who killed the prophets. Verse 32, you, you, you gathered up the cup of God's wrath and it's overflowing upon you. And then verse 33 says, how can you expect to escape God's eternal judgment? So the condemnation was because of rejection. Now he's not speaking to the riffraff of his day. He's speaking here to the so-called religious leaders of the Jewish people. So in verses 34 to 36, Jesus issues a stern warning that will come from such rejection. We see how gracious he'd been. He'd sent messengers to call them to repent. They had not repented. He'd sent messengers to offer salvation and they had not received the offer. And God comes again and again. An opportunity knocks again and again for the people of God there. And yet their hearts and their lives did not respond to God. He'd sent prophets. He'd sent wise leaders with the true message. He's going to send forth his disciples in the days to come. And there will be many opportunities for people to repent. Yet, I know you're going to act like your forefathers, he says to them. You're generally going to reject, re re reject the message and the messengers. I know you're going to reject them, and I know you will persecute them. In fact, you will even crucify some of them, is what he says. You will drive them from the synagogues. You will drive them from your land. You will hound them from city to city. You read the book of Acts. And there you see this actually came to pass. The Jewish leaders hounded the people of God. Thankfully, some would believe on the day of Pentecost, many believed. Later, there were, there were large numbers came to faith. But in relative terms, they generally rejected the message. Again and again, they rejected the message. And again and again, they were heaping judgment upon themselves. They were like us, be accountable for what they have received and whether they've rejected it or not. Whether they've accepted the truth that God sent to them or whether they actually rejected it. It would have been actually better for them, it would have been better for us, if we'd only heard the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, once and rejected it. But they're going to be more accountable as we will be if we've heard and had the opportunity many, many times. It'll be how they will be judged will be how they rejected that message. How these people who are the opposers of the of the faith. How will they stand up and feel? Do they think they'll get away with it? Do they think that it, it doesn't really matter? Well, I'm afraid not. It does matter. And we and them will be those will be accountable. They had been sent from God, prophets, to bring God's message to them. John the Baptist, the last of the prophets, had been sent to them. Now Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, had come into their presence. And after his day, the apostles would go and present the good news of the gospel. And yet generally, these people would reject that message. So the more exposure to God's offer and the rejection of that offer, well, the greater the condemnation. Remember, he says back in Genesis chapter 4, he talks there about Cain and Abel. And Cain could not stand it that his brother, who was a righteous man, the Bible tells us, who was his brother, had been obedient to God's call and he'd offered to sacrifice in the way that God had asked it. Abel did not, Cain did not, but Abel had. Abel had gone and, and, and done what God had asked him to do. And right at the beginning of time, Cain, Cain came and persecuted his brother. It was the first murder. It was the first moment of persecution. And he was the first person to be martyred for holding to what 
was right and to what he believed. In verse 35, but it continued to the end of the Old Testament, to the last man who was to be martyred, God's man, Zechariah, who would be ma martyred. So carrying out God's will, like Abel, sacrificing what God required, like Zechariah bringing the truth of God to the people, ended up in persecution and death. Now God takes note of all the events that take place in this world and in our lives. And we know that he is the judge of all the earth, Psalm 58 and verse 11 tells us. But God will judge and people will be accountable and we needn't worry about time and we needn't worry about um, years and months because I said last week, with God, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. God is concerned about his children. And you touch one of those who are the apple of his eye, Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8 tells us. We're in big trouble. If you touch one of his loved ones, those who are very close to him, the apple of his eye. We see how God holds them accountable for rejecting that offer and for offending and persecuting his loved ones. So, the result of rejection will be God's condemnation and judgment. We cannot play fast and loose with God and we cannot abuse his people without expecting to be accountable for such rejection. But we see also in these little verses here that Jesus reveals his heart. We see revealed the heart of our, of our Saviour, verse 37. Though Jesus had spoken harshly against them who had rejected him, yet here's the heart of Jesus being revealed. The Bible tells me that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Judgment was to fall on Israel, and it wasn't going to be in the too distant future, in fact. Within 30 odd years, Rome would come and they'd totally destroy Jerusalem. And they'd come and they'd scatter all the Jews that were in the land. Many, many would be put to death. And that's a historical fact. In AD 70, that's what Rome did. They came in and they destroyed and, 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 and absolutely brought to ruins the city. At the end of his public ministry, it's interesting how Jesus reveals the feelings of his heart. Now, he's been strong in his words. He's condemned these false teachers. We, we, we're not to be those who condone false teaching. We, we don't condone heresy. We stand against it. But here he reveals also his heart. He felt pain for the people who had rejected that message. Verse 37. How faithful he had been sending his messengers again and again despite their rejection. And what he says, he goes and says, O Jerusalem, and the term really is synonymous with speaking about the whole of Israel. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He repeats it. He, he emphasizes it for intensity that, it, that he felt. Their rejection had had an effect upon the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, it tells us he looked over Jerusalem and he wept. And he says, saying, if you had known, if you had known who had come, but their eyes were blind. Instead of being able to, to, to praise this city and these people, his heart was, was heavy and he, he wept over them. He has to speak of a people who had killed those who had previously been sent. And they would actually crucify the Son of God. And not long after that, they would be the first martyr in the Christian church, Stephen, who they would have stoned to death for what he believed. So they abused the prophets. He, he spoke in parables, didn't he, about how God had expressed such love in chapter 21. The one who, those who abused the one who had hired out his vineyard to these people. And he sent servants to come and to be able to be paid for what they owe. And they abused the servants and eventually they killed them. And Israel had done exactly that. He, he would have gathered them, he said, but they would refused the offers that were brought to them. He says, I would have gathered them as a hen gathered her chicks. It's a, it's a picture often used in the Bible, in, in the Psalms in particular. In The idea is in this idea of, of a chick or chicks coming under the wing of, of the mother hen. 
it speaks about the wings of God coming over his people in Exodus 19. He speaks about taking them up on eagles' wings, bringing them under these wings. He said, I would have brought you under my wings for protection, like a, like, like, like a hen gathers her chicks. When there's danger imminent, when there's some kind of animal going to come and, and, and take the chicks, they run to their mother. They come under her wings. When there's a storm or there's, there's danger brewing, they come and they find their, their, their acceptance under the wings of the mother hen. These people had not done that. In chapter 22 and Luke 14, he uses the same sort of idea with these parables of, of wedding feasts and of, and of um, times of entertainment, times of, of, of praise and happiness when they were invited to come to parties and they just rejected. They made excuses. They wouldn't come. They made light of the offer in the parables. And they even abused the messengers, which is what Jesus is saying they had been doing. So those who were first invited would not come. So they were told the servants to go out into the highways and the byways and invite any that you would come across. And Jesus is saying, my offer is going to go out beyond this nation now. Jesus is saying, I'm coming and I want to protect my people. And how his words have relevance 2,000 years later. How many have heard the voice of Jesus preached? How many times have you heard the words of God read from Scripture? How many times have we heard the offer to come to him, but we've rejected it? He's the one looking over Jerusalem saying, I'm the one who God sent. I'm the final one. He sent his messengers before me. But they would not come. There's a writer or a commentator whose name is Matthew Henry, for those of you who know about commentators. But this man writes a lot on the, on the Bible. And he says this, Christ is far more willing to save than we are willing to be saved. John chapter 5 verse 40, Jesus says himself, you will not come to me that you might have life. So coming under the, the wings of the mother hen, it's a lovely picture of warmth, of love, of protection. It's a lovely picture of being able to be covered and, and to be protected. And the person who does by faith come to God by putting their trust in Jesus Christ, they have found a, a resting place. He has made them glad. He will cover me with his feathers and under his wings I shall abide. There's some verses in the book of Psalms, Psalm, and chapter, Psalm 91. Let me read a few of these verses to you. It says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of my Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that fly, flies by the day, nor of pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Now, the psalmist says the same thing, doesn't he? He tells us that there's a place where we can find peace, a place we can find comfort, security, and hope. To refuse that in verse 38 would result in desolation. As a city, as a nation, it would happen within 40 years. He tells his people, whatever they're doing, those Jews, whatever religious activity they're involved in, if they have not come under the, the comfort and the peace and the covering of Jesus Christ's offer of his own sacrifice, they ultimately know an end of desolation. Whereas they could know peace, comfort, satisfaction. They can try it elsewhere if they want. They may find some satisfaction for a while, but eternally it will not be there. How many have turned their back on the Christian message, sought peace, protection, comfort, happiness, enjoyment in other directions, only to find at the end of their life they feel as if their life is in desolation? With a Christian, 
comes to the end of his life or she comes to the end of their life and they're looking forward to what's before them. The person whose dreams and aspirations have just kind of melted around them. Not fulfilled. Disillusioned. Perhaps even mere religious people just going through the activity of religion. But it's empty. In desolation at the end. No real assurance and satisfaction. The end of their lives. Having come to the one who promised he would cover them with their feathers, with his feathers, and under his wings they could abide. But well, that's the result of rejection, desolation. He reveals the heart of himself as the Savior. He wants people to come to him and under his wings. But he says in verse 39, he will return. You won't see me, he says. But then he says, until. There's the word that gives us hope. Until. He will be seen again. You will see me again. He will come. The one who is blessed, he will come in the name of the Lord. Earlier in chapter 29 of Matthew, verse 9, they've been singing Hosanna to the son of David. From Psalm 118, where it speaks about he that came in the name of the Lord, the Messiah, the coming one. You won't see me again, though, he says. Until you recognize me then without any shadow of a doubt as the Messiah. If we don't recognize Jesus as Savior now, well, one day we will have to recognize him as judge. One day every knee will have to bow. One day every tongue will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will do that willingly or they will do that unwillingly. He's saying to his followers publicly, I will one day declare I am the Savior who came into this world to save people. Until that day when he returns, and he won't return as a babe in a little manger. He'll be returning as the King of glory and the Lord of lords. And he's given his last public declaration here. Reminding them, as he reminds us today, it's the day of salvation. They may not have a chance again. This may have been their last time. We are not certain about tomorrow, are we? Oh, that by faith we put ourselves under the wings and the shelter from the wrath of God to come and not be like Israel who rejected him and have to bow the knee, not as those who have known his covering, but those who will come under his judgment. That's the result of rejection. Yet he reveals his heart, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. But he would not. But one day he will return. And I pray that we will be longing for him to return and looking forward to be able to lift his name high rather than bow the knee and feel that we're under his judgment. Amen. So, my daughter's managed to put a hymn up. There's a hymn to finish our service this evening. I just close this part with a short prayer. So Father, we thank you again for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came and he offered that great comfort and peace that can be found in him. That he's the one who promises to cover us with his feathers and under his wings we can abide. Pray that we'll know that in our own heart. So, but now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that love of God the Father and that abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us all now and always until he comes. Amen.